Honorable Member of the Planning Commission, uh, Register of TU, uh, UN Resident Coordinator to Nepal, Country Manager, Excellencies from uh, uh, different uh, agencies and development partners, uh, distinguished friends, ladies and gentlemen, very pleased to be here to launch the Human Development Report 2019. Uh, having been part of this process for some time now, uh, at least uh, 25 years now, uh, I feel this is my own program. This is uh, why I committed to be here despite my uh, engaging schedule for today. And this being the December 10th, we must celebrate the Human Rights Day also together. So my best wishes to all of you to have our rights protected, preserved, and promoted by all means, including through advocacy by means of the Human Development Reports. Actually, the Human Report, uh, Development Reports have been a kind of uh, pathfinders to see development with human face and development with sustainable future. There is no doubt that these reports have shaped policymakers all over the world. Depending upon who has the capacity and willingness to absorb, understand, and take and carry on the suggestions, recommendations shown by the Human Development Reports. And I think Nepal is one of the countries having taken Human Development Reports throughout its development discourse, through policies, plannings, budgets, and everything. Myself being part of both of the process, I can assure that Nepal has very much close, closely understood the whole spirit of human development and taken steps to ensure that we not only develop in a horizontal, you know, vertical way, but also we have equality in terms of horizontal spaces. Uh, I heard the panels. I heard the panels and I found that there is no unique solution to what we see as a as we want to see more equal societies or more equal countries uh, for that matter, uh, as the SDG 10 also indicates. Does political system matter for inequality? I was hearing Norway and I was hearing Sri Lanka. I don't understand. Norway started with free market and open market economic policies. Sri Lanka started with a bit of socialist policies but the end looks like to be the same, Look, moving towards the same direction. So my first take away from this panel and also from the report, I haven't gone through the report, but looking into the whole development discourse is that political systems may or may not matter for equality. You take the political system right to address inequality, you can achieve equality through your policies, even in a political system which we might not like to be supposed to address inequality. But if we have a political system which is built on the principles of equality, but if it doesn't serve the people equally, doesn't necessarily end up being having had an equal society. So it is up to us to see how we want to use our political system for equality. Basically, the political institutions, if they are inclusive, if they are oriented to the core principles and the, so much to say the fundamental rights of the citizens enshrined in their own constitutions, and for that matter, for Nepal, in our own constitution, the political system must be made to deliver those fundamental rights, means that we have made the floor for equality. But let me also mention, meeting the floor for equality doesn't mean that we will achieve equal societies. Floor is okay. okay, you got the basic education, you got the primary health care, you got the basic literacy in information technology. You have the basic livelihood. You got the basic social protection floor. Everything you got as a floor, you achieve the fundamental civil rights, human rights. What next? The present day society, the challenge is beyond the floor. How do we see that the differences, the inequalities converge over time? Between countries, I mean among countries, within country, within country also among different sections of the society, maybe different uh, spatial regions, geographic regions, among gender, among different abilities of the persons, 
maybe also among different age groups, and more to say, maybe uh, among gender, between gender. How do we ensure that? Now, previously we used to talk about wealth as a major, major key driver of inequality. The physical wealth, financial wealth. Does wealth anymore drive the major component of global growth and development now? That's the fundamental question. What drives the growth process these days? It's the knowledge and technology. So when countries are growing with the strength of knowledge and technology, we have to see that the fundamental differences in equality might derive from the basic education to, te to technical education and then the enhancement in technology and access to opportunities created by all these capabilities. How do we address those things? So having said that, I should also focus that when you have gender equality in secondary education, looks like on floor we are okay. But if you go beyond the uh, secondary education, basic education, we still find a lot of differences in educational achievement by gender. The difference is more so in technical education and scientific education. So we still have the technological knowledge gap between gender, one example. And similarly among countries, those countries which can really afford to R&D, who can really afford to innovation, who can really afford to different kind of discoveries and inventions and invest a lot more on such technology can continue having advancement. Then the issue is, can they really share the, their technology to low-income countries, poorer countries, so that we can also be not left behind, which is the spirit of the SDGs. Is there a global mechanism to ensure that the globally available technology is accessible to countries like ours? to students like ours in the classroom. How do we ensure it? This is fundamental to me. The social institutions. We are not born equal. We are born in different social settings. So how do we bring in equality when we are born unequal? Maybe in terms of social status, income of income status, income of the, the social dignity and status of the parents, many things and many things more. So this is the, the process, the political process, the social and economic transformation process. We must try to minimize the inequalities when you are born in, in an unequal setting. So the initial condition of inequality in a social setting and then social and, and cultural institutions to reshape them would be critically important. In South Asia in particular, we have very strong social institutions the caste system, the social discrimination, exclusion, several other factors keep us in an excluded environment being, means that we are in an unequal environment. So our responsibility as political leaders or, or the agents who work for the society and the economy must ensure that those inequalities are addressed through our proper policies, programs, and institutions. So institutional reform is key. It could be political institution, it could be social and cultural institution, and it could be economic institution. Now, let me talk about those institutions of the market and the institutions of the state. The, state of the, insti the institutions of the states are not always good enough to ensure equality. And that has to do with the political process. Of course, you understand it. The institutions of market, they have one value, one principle. Wealth accumulation, accumulate wealth, make profit. If you are rational, pay proper tax, do the business with social responsibility, but still make money. You have to make money. That's the principle of the market. How do we make the market to function in such a way that market also becomes as a partner to address inequality? And there becomes the role of different factors of production, labor capital, technology included. Now, technology is taking most of the share of the profit, not even capital. Labor is getting the least share. So the source of inequality now boils from the access to technology and how uh, the knowledge and technology aspect is taking most of the profit of the companies or the market, which is generated by different forces. So I would like to know uh, from the global institutions how they want to see 
that the institutions of market could be reformed and reoriented to see that markets also functions to reduce inequality globally and also at the national level. And our state and the market, the only two institutions to ensure equality, I don't think so. We must act with grassroots organization, we must act with cooperative organizations, we must act with non-governmental organizations, and we must act with civil society organizations to see that they also work, not only advocate or help policy making, but also act themselves as an agent of equality. So these grassroots organizations, building their capacities, reorienting them towards building a more equitable society and an economy, and building their institutions are key. So the institutions of the market, the institutions of the state, and the institutions of society at large must work together to see that the growth process is inclusive, development is inclusive, and the divergence of opportunities are narrowed down to, to make them more available to most of them. Now, having said that, I would also turn to some of the issues on global inequality, the countries being uh, unequal. How do we address them? Do we have the global institutions ready to deliver those equality that we are expecting through human development reports? The Bretton Woods institutions, the World Trade Organization, the regional institutions, regional development banks, are they ready to really understand those reforms needed to reduce inequality? Couple of examples. <clears throat> the macroeconomic policies that we set, the fiscal policies, the monetary and financial policies, our trade policies, are they consistent with the spirit of equality among countries that we are expecting? I don't think so. We have to work furthermore. What kind of in, what kind of concessions, preferences, I would say, non-reciprocal treatment in trade, is being made to low-income countries? There is one small window. Does that suffice to reduce our inequality through trade? Similar is the case in aid. None of the developed countries have made their commitment to enhance aid to low-income countries. This is also an unmet commitment. And along with aid, I'm talking again the same technology transfer. Have we been liberal enough to transfer technology to those countries? And then several other factors which could undermine our spirit to have a more equal society. I think we need to restructure, reorient our global institution, global policy makers, not only within the Bretton Woods institution, but also within the UN system, and more importantly, within the institutions and systems which are not within the Bretton Woods system, and not within the UN system, but they are still governing the world through the name whatever we call G7, G20, or whatever, the global new rulers, new governance setters. They must also have programs that must address inequality among countries. Otherwise, we'll be, we'll be able to reduce our inequality within the country. That would be easy, for example, because many things are under our control. But among countries, we must need to change the global institutions. That is fundamental. Within the country, the easiest thing is to reduce inequality within the household. Boys and girls, different ages population, aged population, and taking care of everything but this is a kind of horizontal equality which doesn't mean that we are uh, prosperous. We'll be rather distributing poverty or anything. But that equality doesn't mean when we are still poor. So equality with prosperity is one condition which we must meet through different kind of interventions. And that boils down to from household to society to the whole nation. The government is exactly working to see that the country its own level of inequality would be reduced in the next 10 years' time. We have achieved some, some progress in that. Compared to a period when we used to measure uh, our inequality through income between 96 and 2004, and between 2004 to 2011 through the Living Standard Service, we found that in the later stage we have been able to reduce
Had we been able to, to reduce inequality to a larger extent, our achievement in poverty reduction would have been much, much, fight, much, much faster. Currently, our poverty reduction rate is at a one percentage point every year. But had there been improvement in inequality, that means we, we would have been more equal society, then our poverty reduction would have been much, much faster. So we have to see that our, our poverty reduction strategy is also supported when we have more equal distribution of resources. There are several other indicators to see that if we were a more equal society, we could have more uh, better human development outcomes. I don't want to dwell into that. But my, my final point here is that, are we talking about equality of opportunities, equalities of outcome, equalities of income or wealth, which is part of the outcomes? Or are we talking about equality from an unequal starting point, like in wealth? We have given up discussion on wealth, mostly, because wealth tax, if we talk, that would come in controversy. Because you said that it's accumulated wealth coming from the paid tax, and you don't have to again tax the same wealth so that you will fall in double taxes and everything. Talking wealth tax is a difficult issue. Income tax. Some of our, our policy advisors, advisors say that there should be only two rates of income taxes, not more than that. Progressive taxation was a matter of the past. They don't anymore su suggest us to have a more progressive taxation. And unless we have a progressive taxation, how do we also redistribute income? Subsidies. Most development partners and also some of the bilateral, sorry, multilateral institutions have asked that subsidies only distort the uh, potentials, the opportunities, the capabilities, so should be doing away with subsidies. And unless we have a progressive taxation and subsidy policies, how do we redistribute income? That's, that's a serious issue. And now we are growingly falling into indirect taxes as the major source of revenue. That's obviously a regressive tax system, which treats everybody equally when you consume a certain item. So how do we make the tax system progressive is a matter of discussion. Similar is the case for subsidies. Social protection. Of late, we have been able to introduce social protection as a universal concept and everybody should be benefited. Good? But that also treats everybody equally. Unless we target social protection, that doesn't serve any equality principle. Take, for example, our old age pension. We provide old, old age pension irrespective of whether you are rich or poor. That's, that's a floor. The floor doesn't ensure that you enter in a more equal atmosphere. So we have to restructure our tax system, our subsidy system, social protection system, and more to do, this has more to do with our financial system. Because access to finance is a key element to build productive capacity for the people who are not in the labor market or job market opportunities. So how do we restructure our financial system, financial and monetary policies to ensure equality is again a challenge for, for us at a time when most of the economic crises are triggered by the financial crisis. So, and this crisis also are uh, some key drivers of growing inequality because the opportunities after crisis is grabbed by some section of the society, others lag behind and then we fall into greater inequality. So avoiding crisis coming from climate change included and coming from technological biases and now the jobs being highly technology driven and payment and salary system being different, I think we have to address many of things. The list goes and goes and it's a long list, but I must thank UNDP for having entered in this debate. Though belated, it's never late. First, the first report of its kind, when we were talking uh, post-MDG uh, development agenda, I do remember myself talking to several UN programs on taking inequality as a, as a critical component of next development agenda. And now SDGs incorporate it as a critical component, the 10th SDG goal. So I think it's everybody's now responsibility 
that includes national governments, that includes uh, all civil society organizations, national and international, uh, the development partners and the global institutions supporting countries' development, that their policies must be reoriented to see more equal societies. This is my plea, and this is also my commitment on behalf of the government of Nepal to properly read this document, properly see what of it could be implemented and adopted to Nepal's development discourse to see that our next generation lives in a more even society, equal society. Thank you. Thank you very much.